Welcome back. This is session number four of the 2019 Virtual Genealogy Fair. It's for all skill levels and entitled Using National Archives Records to Research World War I Naval and Marine Corps Records for Genealogical Research. Our speaker is Nathaniel Patch. During his session, Mr. Patch provides you with a guide to discovering the story of your World War I sailor and Marine using the records of the National Archives. Nathaniel Patch is an archivist with the, US, with the U.S. National Archives at College Park and subject matter expert for U.S. Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard records. I'm turning the stage over to Nathaniel Patch. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Nathaniel Patch. Um, I'm the Navy uh, uh, Reference Archivist at, our, at the National Archives in College Park. Um, and we will be uh, di uh, discussing today um, how to use uh, U.S. Navy and Marine Corps records to describe the life and times of your sailor or Marine that served during the First World War. Um, but to begin, um, I just want to go over the um, lecture. Uh, I'm going to start with um, a brief history of the uh, First World War and how the Navy and the Marine Corps uh, uh, participated to give you all context on what your sailor or Marine uh, was doing in Europe at the time of the war. Then we'll go into the, uh, the, the four main steps um, to uh, documenting your uh, sailor or Marine um, using first the, uh, of, uh, the, his official service record, um, and then we'll uh, then uh, concentrate on uh, how to research your sailor, and then, uh, then we'll go on to part three, which is to research your marine. And then I want to take a moment and see about using other records that may uh, add more context to the, to the war at large. So at first, um, the, how the United States enters into World War I uh, is, a, is as a result of Germany's expansion of the un, unrestricted submarine warfare. Um, this infringed upon our ideas of the uh, freedom of the sea and also the um, uh, Germany's attempts to elicit the help from uh, Mexico um, as uh, described in the uh, Zimmerman telegram, um, should the United States enter the war, uh, Germany would have liked uh, Mexico to uh, come on, th on their side and keep the United States occupied. Uh, but on, uh, so, but when, when the war did finally start for the United States on, uh, in April 1917, um, the United States Navy first sent uh, a squadron of, of destroyers to uh, Queenstown, Ireland. And by the end of the war, as shown on the map here, um, there were uh, naval bases pockmarked all across Europe, and including um, the uh, Azores and the Mediterranean, and, uh, and even as far flung as Archangel and Vladivostok, Russia. Um, so the, the Navy first, um, when the war was started, the, the Navy was re relatively a small force. Um, it, it had uh, approximately 5,000 officers and about um, 70,000 um, uh, enlisted. And through the uh, use of the, uh, or the expansion of the Navy through the uh, Naval Reserve Act of 1916, um, it expanded to much larger, to about 33,000 officers and about 500,000 enlisted. And this included uh, female uh, uh, reservists for the first time. So women were not prohibited from joining the Naval Reserve as a result of the, of the act. And, um, and so several hundred uh, uh, joined the Navy and they were part of the Navy and the Marine Corps in the proper sense. They were not just volunteers. They were legitimately part of the military. Um, uh, 
so and um, the, the 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 major tasks of the United States Navy during the First World War included um, transportation and convoying, which means that um, we not only provided ships to uh, transport um, cargo, supplies, troops, materiel, um, but we also organized them into large groups called convoys, and we began to use destroyers and subchasers to escort them from the United States to England and back. Um, this was to deter the German U-boats um, from attacking, and it was uh, relatively uh, successful. And as from the uh, first example, um, a lot of our task was centered around um, anti-submarine operations, and this included not only subchasers and destroyers, but also the use of the aircraft for the first time um, in, 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 this, in this way. Um, so naval aviation and, and Marine Corps uh, aviation expanded during this period. And then um, one of the other major tasks was to lay minefields. And the largest being the what was called the uh, Northern Barrage, which extended from Scotland to uh, Norway to deter German U-boats from using that passage to get out to the open Atlantic. And then the last major uh, use was the uh, naval rail guns. This was used at the end of the war. Um, the Germans had uh, devised a similar weapon system and they were bombarding uh, Paris and so we decided to answer in kind. And the most lar the, the largest guns available were those of the Navy and so they packed them onto rail cars and made the railway batteries. And there were five in total. For the Marine Corps, uh, mobilization um, began uh, as, as the war began. Um, and the uh, Marine Corps was a relatively small force. Um, uh, although they were scattered worldwide, um, they, they had approximately um, uh, uh, 700 officers and about um, 17,000 en enlisted, but they uh, but they were not um, in in large forces. Um, and like um, like with the Navy, um, the uh, Naval Reserve Act expanded the Marine Corps, um, and they eventually uh, had a total of about 3,000 officers and about 75,000 enlisted by the uh, by war's end. Um, and this included 277 uh, female res uh, Marine reservists. Um, as part of the expansion, um, the uh, Marine Corps opened up um, uh, Quantico uh, uh, Marine Corps base as a, a training facility, which then later became a officer training place. And then, um, like with the Navy, uh, Marine Corps aviation expanded um, into uh, two, two major squadron, the, the first aviation squadron and the first Marine uh, air, uh, aeronautical company. Um, and then this is more uh, explanation of the uh, expansion, but of the 30,000 Marines that were sent to Europe um, with the uh, American Expeditionary Forces, Approximately um, uh, 1,600 um, served in, or an additional um, 1,600 served in naval bases all across Europe. Um, of the 30,000, um, 11,000 were taken as casualties with uh, 25 POWs and about uh, 2,500 um, uh, killed in action. And by comparison to, um, other jobs that the uh, na uh, Navy provided during, during the war um, were uh, coastal defense. Um, we were, um, the <laughs> Navy was also involved in uh, building uh, more ships, aircraft, uh, ordnance production, and also expanded um, counterintelligence and cryptography. Um, so with the Navy arriving in Ireland in May, the, uh, the Marines were the first authorized military force to Europe uh, from the United States. 
Uh, the 5th Marines um, mobilized in, in June and arrived in Europe in, in July. And thusly, they uh, earned, earned the moniker first to fight. Um, it, uh, at first, they, uh, the 5th uh, uh, Marines were kind of disembodied, but by uh, September uh, 1917, um, the 4th uh, fourth, uh, fourth Brigade of the 2nd division was formed, and the 4th Brigade was strictly uh, the, uh, the Marines that served there, you know, which included the uh, 5th and 6th Marine Regiments and the 6th Machine Gun Battalion. And as I mentioned before, the uh, uh, Marine Aviation also expanded, uh, which included the 1st uh, uh, Aer uh, Aeronautic Company. Um, this force worked primarily with the with the Navy aviation units in anti-submarine warfare, but the first Marine Aviation Squadron, um, which started out as a squadron side, later developed into a force which consisted of four squadrons, and the these um, squadrons fought inland with the Marines uh, of the um, Second Division, um, and they and this is where the Marines began to develop their close-in air support, which is, has made them famous throughout the subsequent wars. So to begin, um, our, um, the first thing that I would suggest anybody who's going to uh, take on this type of research to research a sailor or a Marine in World War I is to request the um, service record. Um, in this slide, there's, uh, there's an excerpt of the standard form 180, which is the, um, the form that you should use to, um, to uh, request his, um, uh, their service record. The importance of the service record is that most of the records that I'm going to talk about are not going to be arranged by a person's name, and they're also very difficult to, use, to search a particular individual's name. So we need to have information about where your sailor was assigned to or what unit your Marine was assigned to doing this. So this way we can start to unlock the um, uh, records. But the service record can also provide you information not only about assignments but also kinship. Uh, were there any judiciary uh, things done to your Sailor, was he wounded? Was he uh, um, uh, taken a prisoner? Um, so these things can start to set up your 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 research and the items that you would need to look at. Um, again, stressing the point, um, uh, as you read through your um, service record. Please be aware of things like duty stations, uh, ship assignments, travel assignments, um, and dates of when all these things occurred, ranks and rating, um, and service numbers. Because if you have a, uh, a sailor or a Marine that has a common name, you may see it appear in different places and without like ranks and service numbers, you're not, you may not be sure who you're looking at. So those are all things to keep in mind. Um, so as you start to flush out your, your as you read through this service record and you begin to uh, line up all these duty stations and um, assignments and things like that, um, you can um, start getting ready. So, the, so part two, now we're going to talk about how to research a sailor. Um, primarily, the records that you're going to be using are going to be at the National Archives building in Washington, D.C. as part of the Old Military and Civilian Reference Branch. And if you have further questions based on this discussion, um, please uh, email archives1reference at nara.gov or inquire at, at nara.gov. But to begin with, we're going to start with the easy fruit, the low-hanging fruit, if you will. Um, they are primarily in record groups 24 and 45. Um, and I've divided this slide up between ship and non-ship uh, uh, related records. In re record group 24, which is the uh, uh, records of the uh, Bureau of Navigation, 
Um, this is where the deck logs and the must rolls are kept. Um, deck logs are the uh, record of the officer of the watch. So the day is broken up into six four hour watches. And what goes on during that watch um, is recorded. Now, not everything gets in there. So this is not an accurate record of what your sailor did from morning to night. Um, this is you know, where the ship is, location, weather, um, if, it, you know, if there was an accident, if there was an engagement, things like that. Must rules are the um, record of who is assigned to a particular vessel. So this is an accounting document. So this reflects um, what sailors are permanently assigned to that vessel. This is not a passenger list. Although passenger lists can appear in must rolls, that's not what they're really for. Um, and so uh, in, the, in the must rolls, you can see when, when people are promoted, demoted, if they're killed, the Navy tends to just not include you anymore. So if the name drops, that means that something happened. Um, there are um, reports of changes which also indicate, um, and they're inclu in included with the must roll, um, and, and, and they will show you know, these promotions, demotions, and changes to the permanent crew, as in folks that are being transferred to the ships and those that are being shipped off, you know, are um, getting a different uh, duty station. Um, and, this, and this would also be true for the non-ship um, records as well, although the muster rolls are more um, prevalent because stations don't generally keep station logs, although there are some for the World War I period. Um, they're framed in, in the same way as the uh, deck logs. Um, then in RG45, which is the records of, of the uh, Naval Records and Library, there are war diaries. And these are like the World War II war diaries. These are reports to the, to the Chief of Naval Operations um, dealing uh, with the activity of that command, be it a ship, be it a shore station. And these are some examples on, the, uh, on, on my left um, is the logbook, um, and this is the um, what a uh, cover of a uh, deck log looks like, and on, and on my right is the um, must rolls cover. And then these are examples of the war diary, and on my left is the uh, cover of, of the war di uh, diary for the USS Flusher, and on the right is uh, a excerpt from that diary. Also in uh, uh, Record Group 45 are um, several series that relate to um, uh, pr prisoners of war, lost ships. Um, so in entries uh, 257 and 261 are lists of lost ships, um, either sunk, they disappeared, um, or they, they sunk by other means other than combat. Um, they are arranged by the name of the ship and they provide information about how the ship was lost by, and by what means. Um, on the other side, in, in, in entry 266 uh, and 271, um, there, are, there is information about a um, list of officers and, and, and enlisted that were uh, lost, um, either killed in action, missing, um, otherwise, no longer in service, um, and um, they they are the indexes to those series are um, arranged uh, alphabetically by surname, and in entry two seventy one are list of um, prisoners of war, which are also uh, arranged alphabetically by surname, and they and both series provide um, details as to how the sailor came to that particular situation. So in part three, um, we're now going to talk about uh, how to research your marine. Now, this is where things get a little complicated because there are records located in both buildings. So in Record Group 127, which is the records of the US Marine Corps, those records are located at the National Archives building in Washington, DC. 
And because the, the 4th Marine Brigade was part of the uh, American Expeditionary Forces, there are records contained in Record Group 120, the records of the American Expeditionary Forces, which are located at College Park. Technically, the Record Group 120 is considered an Army record and not a Navy record, um, and that's why they exist out at Archives 2 instead of, um, or the National Archives in College Park and not in Washington, D.C. Um, so uh, again, starting off with the low-hanging fruit, what's easily available? In uh, Record Group 127, um, there are uh, unit records, and they are arranged by unit, and there's not too many units for the, for the Marine Corps. Um, as, a, as I've mentioned, there's the um, uh, 4th Marine Brigade, um, which consists of the 5th and 6th Regiments and the 6th uh, Machine Gun Battalion. There are other Marine units that are available within the series, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then uh, Broker Group 120, um, there's an entry um, that is arranged by the Combat Division number. So in this particular case, you would look under the uh, Second Division, um, and then under the uh, Second Division records, there are um, breakdowns of the subordinate commands. Um, like the Navy, the Marine Corps maintained must rolls, and the must rolls um, are monthly, unlike with the Navy, which are quarterly. Um, and sorry for not mentioning that. Um, and for the uh, under each monthly must roll, they are uh, the the Corps is arranged by their command. So you would look for the uh, fifth and sixth Marine regiments, and then find your Marines for each month between uh, July of 1917 through November 1918. Um, now for the, for the Marine Corps must rolls, um, they, are, they have been digitized and they are available an, um, on Ancestry.com. They are not yet available on our, our catalog as yet. So for the records that are in Washington, DC, as I mentioned that there are unit records and they are part of um, entry 240. Um, and so they include the uh, fourth, uh, fourth Brigade, which includes the fifth and sixth Marine regiments, but they also include the fifth Brigade, which was formed and it made it over to Europe at right at the very end of the war in um, uh, November of 1918. And they consisted of the 11th and 13th uh, regiments. These records also include the uh, records about the uh, aviation units. Um, as additional records um, that might be of interest, there is the Commandant's correspondence. So he's the highest ranking Marine within the Marine Corps. And he would have had um, information about the units that were being sent to Europe, um, and what was going on in Europe. And there may be additional reporting given whatever um, circumstances your Marine may, may have been. And if you were interested in the kind of equipment and supplies that, that your Marine may have had during the time, you can also check out the uh, Quartermaster's um, General Correspondence, which is also part of R2-127. Um, for on the Army side, which is at the uh, records out in College Park, there's the uh, records of the combat divisions. And as I previously mentioned, the um, second division is your primary target. Under the division, there's a, there's a section for divisional records, which are arranged by the war decimal uh, classification system. So there may be intermediate or intermediary records in that section. But then after the divisional records, there is a section for the brigades um, and there's a um, section for the 4th Brigade. Then after that will be a section for the 5th Regiment and the 6th Regiment and the 6th uh, uh, Machine Gun Battalion. Um, also at College Park, since you're going to be up there for the 120 material, um, there is a few little odds and ends. There's a, um, in uh, Record Group 407, which is the uh, records of the Adjutant General, under the uh, Central Files um, 
section. Um, there's a there are there are files for the Marine Corps, and then there's a section on the um, uh, decorations for the um, Second Division. Um, also in uh, Broker Group 120, uh, 117, which is the records of the American B uh, Battle Monuments Commission, um, there are uh, there's a uh, correspondence with officers from the um, Second Division, which includes Marine officers as well. Now, Part Four um, is basically taking all this information that you're getting from the low-hanging fruit. And if you want to go beyond just naming a ship and finding where the ship is gone and what it's doing, if you want to put that ship or that Marine unit into a larger context of the war, you know, was it part of a squadron? Was it doing anti-submarine operations? What were they doing? Then the next part of this of this talk, we'll, we'll then go into what kinds of information that you need to collect to go this way, and then what series may be able to help you get a little further. So this is going a little bit beyond genealogy or the basic roots, but um, you might find it interesting all the same. So as you go through like a sh uh, ship records on the deck logs, they will list not only the ship's name, but it also also give you a list of the command structure. And, un, and there may be records for each portion of the command structure. For the aviation units, um, you have the squadron, and then you also have the air base. So there may be records about the air base as well. So, um, and part of the way that you can um, also track uh, information, particular to your relative, is if you go through the must rolls and he's transferring from from station to station, ship to ship, you can then follow his career that way as well, in addition to what um, information that you find within the um, service record. Um, so once you've gathered all that information, um, the next few slides are just going to touch on different World War I era records that are, um, that are available. I'm not going to go into the same sort of details I did with the low-hanging fruit. Um, so one record group of use would be RG-38, which has a number of correspondence uh, and pu uh, publication files um, relating to uh, World War I. Um, and uh, in, in particular to the uh, commander of um, naval forces in European waters. Um, in RG-72, which is the uh, records of the Bureau of Aeronautics, and this is kind of strange because the Bureau of Aerona Aeronautics didn't exist during World War I. Um, it was established later. And so uh, as you can see from the listing of uh, series, a lot of these records were maintained by the Chief of Naval Operations, and so when the Bureau was established in the 20s, those records were transferred from the CNO to the uh, Bureau of Aeronautics. But if you were interested in how aviation was being applied to anti-submarine uh, operations, how they were thinking, what they were developing, would probably be uh, discussed here as well. Um, And then this is one of my all-time favorite record groups. This is Record Group 313, which is the records of naval operating forces. Um, the reason why this record group is so interesting to me is that it's a uh, complement to RG-38 and also RG-45, which are generally records that are sent from the field to Washington. So in 38 and 45 are the records sent to the Chief of Naval Operations. Whereas the 313 material are the administrative and correspondence files of the field commanders. So if you wanted to know how a particular battle was going to go or if they were planning on doing something but they didn't, you can look into these records. Um, and um, there are 32 entries in total. I only listed here just the highlights, the ones that I think would probably interest people. 
um, including the submarine force um, and uh, cru cruiser and uh, transportation forces since convoying was a, uh, a huge importance during World War I. But also the submarine was also uh, uh, very important as well. But we know more about the U-boat than we do our own uh, submarines during the war. So there's that as well. Um, now, the Marine Corps, and be careful when you tell a Marine this, um, the Marines were a part of the Department of the Navy. And so um, as a result of that, you might be able to find some Marine Corps related records in Navy records. And so here again, um, I've listed a uh, number of series um, that may have um, Marine Corps related materials uh, in a Navy record group, in particular with um, marine aviation. Um, if you are, if you have a relative or you're interested in that, the Bureau of Aeronautics would have overseen both the Navy and the Marine Corps um, a, uh, aviation aspects. So the development of aircraft, the tr training of personnel, and overall a application of aircraft during that period. Um, also in um, uh, RG3, uh, th uh, th uh, 313 are the um, records of naval operations in, in European waters, which again, these are the London office. So, so these are the uh, records of Admiral Sims, who is the commander, and what he was being told by the British and how the British and the United States were coordinating to uh, conduct the naval war. Um, here's some uh, additional uh, uh, Marine Corps uh, records that uh, may be of interest um, for uh, researching a Marine. Um, these are down in the Washington, D.C. office. Um, there's a number of registers, including registers of deserters, discharges, non-commissioned officers, um, and an al alphabetical list of um, Marines, of enlisted Marines covering the early period of the, of, of the Marine Corps. Uh, there's also a, a large number of, of records relating to casualties. Um, and uh, there are lists of uh, death records, um, death registers of enlisted, um, and uh, in particular, uh, a register of deaths during the First World War. Um, out in St. Louis, um, which is the National Military Personnel Record, in addition to having the service records for the Navy and the Marine Corps during this period, they also hold the burial case files. And this is, a, uh, although it's in RG-92, which is the records of the U.S. Army Quartermaster General, um, they include all services. So these are the records of where American personnel, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, were buried. Um, and, and, and so uh, this too would have uh, uh, information uh, relating to kinship, how the person died, where they you know, lived before they joined the service. Um, and you can add, uh, request for these records as you uh, request um, their service record with the SF-180. And then um, lastly, we have um, um, special media. So there are any number of records in the uh, cartographic section, which includes graphics like maps, posters, um, ship plans, um, and, um, and then on the other side, we have um, still photographs, um, which in, uh, includes, you know, pictures of places, people, ships, and things of that nature. So, um, with that, let the adventure begin, and if there are any questions. Thank you so much for your presentation, Nathaniel. Um, a lot of really great information on there. We do have a couple questions from our online audience. Can the service record form be used from someone who served in World War II or Vietnam? Uh, sure. 
I mean, I mean, I mean you, you can re, uh, 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 request a service record. Um, I think as l late as 1992, but the service records for the sailors and Marines in World War I are part of the National Military Personnel Archives, which means that those records have been accessioned to the National Archives and are now part of the public record. Whereas for the Vietnam War, since they were um, separated after 1962, they're still part of the National Military Personnel Records Center, which is, um, uh, makes it a, a, a Department of Defense record. And so you have to adhere to um, certain you know, kinships to uh, request the records. Thank you for clarifying that. Why would they consider American Expeditionary Force Marines to be among Army records? Can you explain that a little bit more? I'm not entirely sure how, uh, well, it, in terms of the records themselves, it's the records that were generated. So um, the American Expeditionary Force was under the command of a U.S. Army General, uh, General Pershing. Um, and, and so, he was basically in charge of that whole uh, force. It just happens to be that the U.S. Marine Corps got, for lack of a better term, invited to the expedition, so they were essentially under the operational control of a U.S. Army command. So the um, in in World War One, they hadn't made the um, delineation between. U.S. Infantry Divisions versus U.S. Marine Corps Divisions, um, which is what you have during the Second World War. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you. One of our viewers says, my grandfather joined the Navy during World War I. Too late, they discovered he was only 15 years old and sent him home. Several years ago, I requested his service record and was told nothing existed. Probably because he was sent home. And um, so, therefore, his, he never fully enlisted. And so that, that's why there's not a record. Okay, another personal question. I've heard a story about my great-grandfather serving on a Navy ship during World War I that came under attack. I don't know what ship he served on. Could you briefly explain how I might get started to find out more about his experience? First thing I would do is request his service record and that should tell you what ships he was serving on, then you would have to kind of, unfortunately at this point would be the methodical method, um, is just to in, investigate each ship that he was assigned to during his service. Um, and then you can use either, um, or use both the deck log and the war diaries, deck logs being an RG24, and the uh, board diaries in, in RG45. Um, and then just try to account for each attack that, that, ship, that those ships came under, and that should answer your question. What is an example of special operations that a Marine might have been discharged to participate in? During World War I. <laughs> um, Well, uh, I, I don't rightly know. Um, uh, they didn't, the, the Marines at that time weren't really doing special operations, not in the way that the Marines today do. Um, so they were basically an auxiliary infantry unit, if you will. Um, and that's why they were jo joining up a, well, with a uh, army uh, unit. Um, now, of special operations, um, the uh, first Marine uh, squadron uh, uh, was asked to do um, sp special jobs because um, they were asked to bombard uh, German U-boat pens, and apparently the uh, Army Air Corps and the Royal Air Force were not very keen on, on doing those jobs because they are heavily defended, so they got the Marines to do it. Um, but for being discharged, um, well, you could be discharged for any number of reasons. Um, you can be discharged for medical, um, uh, psychological. 
um, issues. Um, shell shock was just becoming uh, a, a thing um, and affecting the troops well, you know, uh, that were along the front. So. We have a couple of viewers who have family members who were part of the Marine Corps and Army bands during World War I. Mm -hmm. Are there records of those bands? Of the bands itself? Um, that I don't know. I mean, I would, um, probably what I would look towards is the uh, Commandant's correspondence and look, um, depending on how they're arranged, um, they, they're, they're maybe a filing designation for bands and you can find out how the uh, bands were deployed at that time. Um, that's basically where I would start. But um, again, too, I would look to see uh, from the um, um, service record is, um, if there were delineations between different bands, like if there was uh, like a regimental band versus a, you know, um, well, they didn't have uh, divisional bands, but um, if there was a special or organization band, let's say, um, and then that might help you to look in different places. Now, the band, now if the bands were sent overseas, again, uh, Commandant's correspondence, and you might also check the flag files for the uh, commander naval forces in U European waters because obviously the band was playing for somebody and they might have been playing for him. If a pilot was shot down and buried in Europe, would those burial records still be in St. Louis? Yes. Okay, and related to that, is there a list somewhere that shows what type of military records are kept at which archival center? Um, well, there's the catalog, um, that, that would help. Um, and hopefully this um, uh, presentation will help uh, to delineate that as well. So essentially the, the main division is that for World War I era, records that are generated by the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Marine Corps are going to be in the Washington, D.C. area at the National Archives building, while U.S. Army records from the same period are going to be at the College Park um, place, now, uh, or archives. Um, but in terms of personnel records, individual personnel records are going to be in St. Louis, and anything uh, that are personnel related like the burial case files are gonna be also located at St. Louis. All right, our final question is a little bit more lighthearted. How do you keep track of all of these abbreviations, numbers, and letters? <laughs> Practice. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you so much, Nathaniel. Uh, for our viewers, if the presenter did not get to your question, please send an email to inquire at nara.gov Videos and handouts will remain available after the event from this YouTube page and from the fair's webpage.